that I eat soup. And it's been just terrific. So what I did for Christmas to them is I sent them oranges, half of which were rotten. I don't know if that many. I got them from uh, Gregory's Groves. Don't get anything. I sent out over a thousand dollars worth of oranges to people who had done really nice things to them. Thousand dollars worth of oranges. And well, more than half of them ended up where they were a third to a half rotten when they got there. So they had to replace you got a replacement? Three replacements? Hey, we can have orange juice. Put a little vodka with that, but that's what we did. <laughs> so this is something I have ordered this also with Bob's. We have traveled the world. And I know that Molly will confirm this as we travel the world. We behave as family who love each other when we're around the world. And I'm so grateful that I've been involved in the, the birth and the, and the development of their children. And in Molly's case back here, Molly, I was there when Jason was born. I think I saw Jason before you did, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and so we have Jace, we have Luke, we have Jonah, and then we have Marie, who has my heart. You know, she is 11 or 12? 12. 12. And her birthday is January the 8th. Okay. <laughs> How could I forget that? She puts notes on my car. I love you. They call me Dubby Dub. I don't like that. You know, just don't call me Bob. <laughs> and so I have to ask you. I, you know, I'm uh, I'm really a romantic about the things I do. I love what I do. So do you have a cure for me? Do you have a cure for me? And I'm not looking for a cure for my illness. That's going to work out itself. But how do you cure a hopeless romantic? And I don't think you can. So I have to do that. I make good choices. And I think I've made those choices. And I think I've made those choices because people like those of you sitting here are the craftsmen of my life. You're the craftsmen of my soul. You're the craftsmen of my spirit. And what I brought here for you is actually a cremation urn that was given to me in 1989 uh, in Seoul, Korea by a gentleman by the name of Gregory Cho. Gregory's niece, Unan Cho, so we may have, is in our PhD program right now. But this cremation urn has been on display, I think my wife has given me a hint, has been on display in my house on this since I got it. She thinks it's a beautiful piece of furniture. So I said, are, are you really going to put my ashes in this thing? She said, are you crazy? You're going to be in a cardboard box and we're going to throw you off the end of Cumberland Island and down in Georgia. That's what we're going to see. That's great. You know why? Because the tides come in and out. She's going to be eating at Brett's Marina Cafe with her new husband who's left handed. You know, and, and they're going to be using my American Express card, but I'll go out with the tide and I'll eat with them. I think that's great. But within this today, I can tell you the spirit that you give to me. You shake the mold and polish me. I love what I do. I'm blessed with what I do. I'm honored to be here with you each and every day. I don't look for excuses not to come. But if this contains spirit, this would be a priceless vase. To me, it's a priceless vase anyway. I have so many positive memories of you. Uh, Tim Nguyen came in today from Tyson. I haven't seen Tim in, since he graduated. I'm really surprised. Uh, Hannah and uh, Jordan, I'm sorry, Jordan, Nanta came in today. I haven't seen them in a long time. But they're an inextricable part of my life. And some of you, like Stacia and like Sarah, I've known since the day you were born. You guys have made me better. You have made me a better human being. I am a better person because of you. And I thank you for that. I'm blessed for that. Too. So, here's what I think you have to do to be able to be somewhat um, beneficial in life. Social judgments are based upon how I speak, what I say to you, how I look, and how I behave. That's how you define me. That's how you define every one of your professors, and that's how you define every one of your friends. Isn't that awesome? Think of that. You're putting, you're processing all of these things and sifting out the things that you don't want to see because we have a very selective orientation and only seeing the things that you really want to see. My granddaughter did that. She got married two, two and a half years ago, and she's now getting a divorce. She didn't sift out all the things that she really wanted to see. She only saw what she wanted to see, and she didn't see some of the things she should have actually seen. I've often said to her, you have your choice of behaviors. How you behave, how you speak, how you dress, how you look when you speak, what you have to say will define who you are and will define your destiny. And I think that's absolutely true, Alex. Alex, I've known you for two and a half, three years, right? Fortunately, I know your, your sister, too. And it makes a big difference uh, in terms of where we are in life. So, here's something that was on the first slide you may not have read, but I wanted to read this to you. I think this is true. This is what you have helped me to be. 
able to see. Okay? It says, watch my thoughts. What I mean to myself is I want to watch my thoughts for they become my words. How I think is how I'm going to talk. And if I don't think positively, I'm probably not going to be too positive. But I like to be positive. Choose my words for they become my actions. My words tell me what to do. They become. They're translated. They're like putting a, uh, the ever ready bunny. You know, they're always there. They always make me do what I have to do. But I have to choose my words. I need to understand my actions, what they are. Because for them, they become my habits. And I wonder sometimes, if I behave negatively toward you, what am I going to gain from that? My son will occasionally say things to me that I don't like, and my response is a good response. And how would you expect me now, Steve, to respond to what you said? I don't know exactly how to do that. But how would you expect me to respond except close my checkbook? It makes him think. So people may not ask you about what you meant, but you have to anticipate that maybe they'll make some meaning out of that. I need to study my habits, which I do on a regular basis, or they become my character. Who is my character? Well, I'll tell you what I honor in my life. I will tell you that I am trustworthy. These are the characteristics that I have, the attributes. I am trustworthy. I am loyal. I am helpful. I'm friendly. I'm courteous. I'm obedient. I'm cheerful, I'm thrifty, I'm brave, and I'm clean and I'm reverent. Those are the characteristics that define me and have defined me since I was eight years old. I'm a boy scout. I'm prepared, and I do believe in the golden rule of doing a good turn daily, but those things have been ingrained in me since I was eight years old. And so when I interact with people that are around me, adults, not my, not my mother and my father, have made my character what it is today. I think back to when I was seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven, and the most important person in my life um, was uh, a young a lady by the name of Connie McBrogan. Her son Raymond and I were the same age, and she was a Girl Scout leader. And so, whenever she took the Girl Scouts camping, Raymond and I got to go with her. So we got we went down to the swamp areas of Miami Beach, and we would scare them. We would dress up in moss, and we would scare them. This is when we were seven or eight years old. We had a ball with them. But Connie McGrogan affected my life and helped me to realize there were things important in my life that I needed to be more than just a 7, 8, 9, or 10 year old child. When I was 13 years old, I met a woman by the name of Augusta Ship, a very close friend with someone uh, by the name of Elvis Presley. And uh, she was known as Augusta. And her husband's name was Lloyd Ship. They lived <coughs> three or three more houses down for me. And they embraced me as if I was her son's Paul's, Paul Baby, as we call him, his son's. Brother. And through the time that I was 13 to the time that I was 18, Mr. and Mrs. Shipman shaped my life. They also taught me how to play pool pretty well, too, as a matter of fact. And they taught me how to play cards, so I knew how to play poker before I got too old. They taught me some things that were really, really beneficial for me. But they were extremely wonderful. You know what? This is an honest to gosh fact. I would like to talk to them today. But they passed away about 15 or 18 years ago. I would love to talk. My father died in 1981 when I was here on the interview. I would like to talk to my father today, but I can't do that. I don't. My, my wife is at home. She's renovating our house. I don't want to go home. Um, <laughs> but you know, you think you think in terms of. I may not see her again. I have to drive the four and a half miles from here back to my house. I may not see them again. So one of the things I said to Jeff today, I, I know that I said this to you when you came down and talked to me. I shook your hands, hugged you, and I said, "I love you." I think you should always tell people if you love them, you should. Because you don't know that you're ever going to see them again. And I have learned that in the last 30 months. Before that, I didn't recognize that so much. But the nature of the situational variables in my life have changed. The greatest support that I have had during that time does not come from Dr. Sun and Dr. Manning and Dr. Oakhill. The greatest support in my life comes from those of you that are sitting out here. You make me want to come to school. You have shaped me to want to come to school. School. You make me, you have shaped me, you have rewarded me to want the benefits and the values of being here with you. You've done that. That's the power that you have. Individually, you may not have a lot of power. If all of you picked up a rock right now, I'm going to tell you, throw your rocks at me if you have them. You don't have those rocks, right, Hannah? Did I give you a rock? Okay, but they're going to turn into gold at the end of this presentation in just a few minutes, as a matter of fact. Would you like to go back and get a rock now? They will imagine that the glass ones won't turn into anything. Those are fake rocks, but the real rocks will have value. And Hannah, you and Jordan are in my rock watch, and I really appreciate it. I have pictures of you that I sold at your wedding anyway. They were on the table, remember those? I wanted a picture I could remember of you, so I took it out and put it in my pocket. <laughs> I want to be 
become my, my habits become my character, and I want to develop my character, which you've done. I haven't done that. You've shaped me. You've molded me, and you've polished me into what I am today. And I'm not a masterpiece, but I still want me. And you can help me be able to do that because that becomes my destiny. And my destiny is one that embraces you and has relationships. That's what I want to be able to be in my life. And I think that's important. I've also found in my life that I have to manage something that's really important to me, too. Scott, you'll appreciate that because Scott and I work on Saturdays and Sundays. Another one of the faculty do, too. But we work on Saturdays and Sundays, and that would suggest to my wife you're not managing your time. You know? So I have found that I need a compass in my life to help me manage my time. And this is the compass that I have. My compass has a north and south that is urgent, and an east and west that's important. And so the things that are, by my way, thank you for coming. The things that are important and urgent, I can do them right now. Tonight's important and urgent. It's date-driven, it's time-driven. It's important and it's urgent. And I'm happy to be here. And I'm proud to be here, Shelby. So do it now. I have other things that are urgent, but they're not very important. Like, for example, some of you may be doing it right now. When your phone buzzes or rings, you have to answer it. You don't have to answer the damn thing. You don't have to do that. You know, you're not a mouse, a mouse running through a maze. You can put that off. You can turn it off. But it's too important. You made it urgent to answer that. And it's just someone telling you to bring a pizza to the beer bar. You know, maybe. I don't know. So, you do it now, but maybe you shouldn't do it now. And then I have the things that are not urgent, but they are important, and that's what we call planning. We plan for those things. And I've planned for my continuing life, because I have a James Dean orientation toward life. I'll explain that to you in just a couple of minutes. And then you have the things that are not important, not urgent. And no, we're so darn good at being able to do those things that we do those things all the time. You should put it in a Sunday situation. The things that are not important and not urgent shouldn't take up your time. But they're so much fun, we do them so well, we just keep doing them. And if we did them the same way yesterday and do them today, we're going to do them again tomorrow the same way. The past predicts what the future is going to be. Make a choice to use your time. You have 168 hours a week. That's what I've got. What do you get out of 168 hours a week? I have time for my family. I have time for my wife. I have time for, for work. I don't have, I haven't, I just not here to say that. I have translated the time for some things that I know I should be doing, and they are becoming more important to me, and I'm beginning to do those. I recognize that I'm deficient in some of those areas. So maybe take an example, if you will, from my comments. Ask yourself what's important in your life and what's urgent in your life. And do the things that are urgent and important. That's what you're going to be evaluated on. You're going to do the things that are not urgent but important. That's what you're going to be, but you're not going to be evaluated on the unimportant things that are either urgent or not urgent. You're not. It just doesn't happen. Not in my life. So, this is a statement that comes from Daniel Gibran. It says that wisdom ceases to be wisdom when it becomes too proud to weep, too brave to laugh, and too selfish to seek other than itself. Well, you're in a, uh, a mothership of wisdom here at the university. A lot of wisdom around. But you know the good part about our colleagues is they recognize the wisdom isn't the end. It's only the stepping stones to where you want to be able to go. Gibran says a lot. This is one of Gibran's also. This is in the inside of my wife's wedding ring from May the, I hope I'm right, 27th, 1977. It says, when love beckons, follow. And that's what I'm going to ask you to do. I've learned that when you love something a lot, Paige,